in Luke chapter number 18, Luke chapter 18, what would you say to someone who asked you, what must I do to be saved? Or what must I do to have eternal life? Well, I want to start out this evening by comparing three responses to that question found in the Word of God. Luke chapter 18, verse number 18 and a certain ruler asked him, of course, asking the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. And the reason why he's saying that to him, because he knows this man's heart, and he knows this man doesn't believe that he is God. So he's saying, Why are you calling me good if you don't believe I'm God? Well, of course, he is good because he is God. He said, thou knowest the commandments. Now, if somebody came to you and said, uh, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Would you say, well, you know what the commandments are. <laughs> no, you wouldn't say that. But this is under the law here. This is law dispensation in which Christ is saying this. He conducted this whole ministry under the law. He said... Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he's giving some of the Ten Commandments here. And he said, all these have I kept for my youth up. Well, I have a hard time believing that, but nonetheless, this guy's saying, oh, I'm doing this, I'm following these commandments. So Jesus presses it. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou one thing. Now, here's a test. Do you really believe me? He said, sell all that thou hast, distribute unto the poor. Thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me. He said, do the commandments. He said, I'm doing those. He said, okay. Well, if you're going to believe my message, you're, you believe the kingdom's at hand, do you? That's what he's preaching, right? The gospel of the kingdom. Well, if you believe that, you're going to sell out, give to the poor. And that was required to be a disciple in the earthly ministry of Christ. He said, this is what you need to do to prove your faith. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? See, it was required of them to prove their faith. If they believed that kingdom was coming, they wouldn't need all that. They were going to have much more in the kingdom. They had to trust in the Lord to take care of them and bring them into the kingdom. It was a test of faith is what it was. It's easier, he said, for a camel to go through the, a needle through a needle's eye than for a rich man entering the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, who then can be saved? And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And by the way, in all ages, salvation is of the Lord. Okay? That's a, that's a basic principle. It's possible with God. It's impossible with men. Now, well, let's just read on. Verse 28. Then Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. They've proven their faith. He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and the world to come, that's the kingdom age, life everlasting. They'd be resurrected to enter into that kingdom with those uh, riches, their inheritance, and it's an earthly inheritance and so on. And uh, it's not my point to expound in that. I'm just starting there to show you. A man asked him point blank, What do I need to do? To have eternal life. Christ is not playing games with them. Christ spoke the truth. He was plain. He was direct. He said, all right, then, you know, you need to be keeping the commandments. And he said, well, I'm doing that. He said, well, if you believe me and you believe my message, this is how you're going to prove it. Okay, and then that's what it says. I know some people that try to water it down, say that's not what he meant. He was actually playing mind games with the guy. I don't believe that. I believe he meant what he said. <laughs> And so by the, you know, when you rightly divide, you can let the Bible say what it says. You don't have to mess with the text. You can believe it just like it's written. And when you rightly divide, it makes sense. It all fits. When people don't rightly divide and they're trying to make everything in the Bible line up with this age, 
that won't work. So then they got to start watering it down and trying to change what it clearly says. Now, I won't turn over there, but you know in Acts 2, the men of Israel that Peter's preaching to said, what shall we do? We've killed our Messiah. You've proven that Jesus is the Christ risen from the dead. We've killed our Messiah. What shall, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Is that what you would say to somebody who said, what do I need to do? And, the, and, and, and when it comes to being saved, having eternal life, what do I need to do? Would you tell them, well, what are the commandments? Are you keeping the commandments? Are you selling all? Are you... No, you wouldn't say that, and you wouldn't say, and I hope you wouldn't say what Peter said, because that's not the right answer today. But Peter was preaching to Israel, and he gave them the word of God uh, that was to them at that time. But you come all along later in the book of Acts, and there's a Gentile jailer in, in Philippi who asked the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, a Gentile name, he said, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Now that's the only answer for this present age. But you, is, is that not three different responses to the question? I mean, so, now, what Christ said in his earthly ministry and what Peter said are similar. Uh, they have to prove their faith by their works is what the point was. But Paul said, no, you simply believe on the Lord and you're saved when you believe on the Lord. You don't have to go through a, a, a thing of proving your faith and doing these things. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Somebody wants to point out, well, the jailer got baptized after that. Where in the text did Paul tell him he had to be? It's not in there. Paul didn't tell him he had to be. The question is, what must I do to be saved? The answer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Paul didn't say anything about getting baptized when it comes to salvation. In fact, he said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So therefore, we know Paul was not telling the jailer he had to be baptized because that was not in his gospel. Now, one of the most important things about right division is that it enables us to understand and clearly present the only gospel by which sinners are saved in this present age. How vital that is. And yet, one of the biggest problems people have with right division concerns this very issue. The fact we understand there's more than one gospel in the Bible. The fact we understand salvation is not exactly the same for everybody in every age. People have a problem with that. The common and traditional view is that salvation is the same for all people in all ages. And most professing Christians believe there's only one gospel in the Bible. And it's not because they necessarily, you know, personally studied that out and came to that conclusion. Maybe some have, and they came to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> but mainly it's because that's what they've always heard. You know, that, that, that's always preached. There's one gospel, one gospel in the Bible, and, and people just accept that. But mixing passages together that concern different gospels for different dispensation, it leads to confusion and to the preaching of a false gospel for this age. Okay, now, I was at the post office today, and... <clears throat> They, the Church of Christ, you know, the so-called Church of Christ, they put out a, a thing that they always leave it at the post office for people to pick it up. And if it wasn't on camera, there's probably a security camera. If it wasn't for that, I'd probably throw them on the trash. I'm tempted to do that every time I go in there. But I always at least take one and say, well, that's at least one somebody won't get. But they, Church of Christ believes you have to be baptized to be saved. In fact, in fact, here, here's, their, here's God's plan for saving man. All right, divine love, God's grace, Christ's blood, Holy Spirit's word, sinner's faith, sinner's repentance, sinner's confession, sinner's baptism, Christian's love, Christian's work, Christian's hope, Christian's endurance. <laughs> They're teaching work salvation. Now listen, I, I was reading this article, and that's probably why my blood pressure gets up too much, because I read stuff like that. I shouldn't even read this stuff. But anyway, it says... Um, some dangerous, and by the way, the, the title of this article is Salvation is Free, but it's not cheap. And the first point is salvation is free. I mean, that's what the article's about, but listen to what it says. 
Some dangerous heresies are, see, they get people's attention by saying it's free, but then when you read the article, they're not saying that. They're, they're telling you it's not, that you've got to do something. So they're liars. Some dangerous heresies are circulating about grace. They are so ugly, they probably make the angels blush. A boy, a boy asked one preacher, sir, what can I do to be saved? The preacher replied, son, you're too late. What? exclaimed the boy. I'm too late to be saved. No, you're too late to do anything. Jesus already did it all 2,000 years ago. Amen. I like that answer. This is what they say. It is strange that Peter did not know that. When he was asked on Pentecost, what shall we do? Acts 2. <laughs> he did not say you're too late. Jesus did it all 50 days ago on the cross. There's nothing for you to do. Instead, the Holy Spirit instructed him to say, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for mission of sins. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wrong version. Uh, there was something for these believers. Listen, there was something for these believers to do to be saved. And the historian con continues, talking about Luke writing the book of Acts, and with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So, you know, they, they're, they're, look, water baptism never has saved anybody, okay? But it was required under the gospel of the kingdom for them to prove their faith. If they believed the message, they would do what the message said, but, so, but what they're clearly teaching is that that's the, that's, you got to go to Acts 2 to know how to be saved in this age. And, uh, you know, the remission of sins for Israel as a nation comes at the second coming under the new covenant. If you just read the next chapter in Acts 3, verses 19 to 21, it makes that clear. Their sins are blotted out at the second coming. But they had to repent and be baptized to be identified with that and to be a part of that. So you see how dangerous it is? To mix all these things together? Now the common cliche that people in the Old Testament were saved by looking toward the cross, just like people in the New Testament are saved by looking back to the cross. You've heard that? That's a cliche. But it's repeated so much people think it's in the Bible somewhere. It is not in there. It's not in the Word of God. How can that be true when the twelve apostles weren't even looking to the cross? They weren't looking forward to the cross. The fact they had been preaching the gospel for three years before Christ even began to talk to them about his death, burial, and resurrection. And when he did, they had no clue what he was talking about. That proves there must be different gospels in the Bible. In Luke chapter 9, if you want to flip back there, and then we're going to come right back to 18. In Luke chapter 9... Christ sends out the twelve, gives them instruction. Well, let's just read in verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Well, the healing was a sign of the kingdom they're preaching. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, nor, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house you enter into, there abide and thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. Judgment will come on them. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. And they continue on. And then you come to Luke 18. Now this is at the end of his ministry. And you know the verses, but let's look at them again. Verse 31. Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So this was prophesied, but it wasn't understood. The full meaning wasn't revealed yet, as you'll see here. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they said, of course, that's what we've been preaching these last three years. <laughs> no, look at what it says. They understood none of these things. The saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things that were spoken. 
God emphasized the point. They didn't know that. I remember, I remember the first time I really looked at that verse and accepted what it said, and it really opened my eyes. I mean, I remember reading that and said, that proves, that proves that any unbiased, clear-thinking person, not blinded by religious tradition, there's more than one gospel in the Bible. Because the gospel we preach today is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. They didn't understand it. They didn't believe it. Okay, not at this point. It's clear as day. Yet they're preaching the gospel. Now, there is much confusion on this issue of dispensational salvation. I mean, there really is. And there's a lot of fighting that goes on, a lot of controversy. And I'm not naive enough to think I'm going to clear it all up in one lesson a night. I'm not talking about in our church. I'm talking about out there in among professing believers that are studying the Word of God. There's a lot of confusion, and I have to say that some of the blame is to be laid at the feet of dispensational preachers and teachers. Because the way they talk about this, they sure make it sound like salvation is by works in other dispensations. That's false. That's, it's impossible for God to save a sinner by works. Okay? Now look, God has never and He will never accept the works of sinful flesh. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, all our righteousness are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Jesus said in John 6, the flesh profiteth nothing. John 6, verse 63, Paul said, in Romans 7, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Do you think that was different under the old, uh, in other ages? That's the same in every age. In every age, sinful flesh is sinful flesh. It cannot please God. Paul said, um, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8, verse 8. That's true in every age. Okay, so there's confusion because people, I think a lot of times, some of us who understand this, we, we need to be more careful in how we explain it. Okay, if we're giving people the idea that people are saved by works in any age, we're giving them the wrong idea. That's not right. That's not true. And there's no way sinful flesh can do a work that God will accept and, and save that person for. If that was possible, why did Jesus Christ even have to die on the cross? And it kind of, I'll be honest with you, it just kind of irks me sometimes when I hear, and, I, and some of the preachers, I know they don't mean what it sounds like they're saying, but they're careless in how they say it. And, I, and, and I'm guilty of it sometimes too, I'm sure. But we need to be more careful with this. Now, this could be a very long and deep study because there are so many details to consider if we're going to do an in-depth study on dispensational salvation. I mean, for example, there's a difference between individual salvation and national salvation. Uh, furthermore, the word salvation does not always refer to the eternal salvation of the soul. You've got to look at the context of the word. I mean, in the Old Testament, the word salvation usually is talking about physical deliverance. It's not even talking about salvation in the sense we mean it today. What about Gentiles in the Old Testament? What about those before Abraham? You know, Genesis 1 to 11 covers 2,000 years. Did you know that? What about those who are going to be born in the kingdom age? You know, we can go on and on with all these details, but I think these five points, they're simple points that at least give us a basic framework in understanding this issue. So let's, let's talk about this. First of all, the basis of salvation in, in any age, in every age, it's got to be the blood of Christ. work of Christ, His shed blood. There's no redemption without the blood of Christ. Now, the death and resurrection of Christ is the only basis upon which God will accept a sinner in any age. It was planned before the world began. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that it would take place. But, of course, it was not understood or preached as good news until it was accomplished, until after it was accomplished. And, and, of course, the full meaning of what was accomplished 
was given to Paul, revealed to him, and he's the first one. Just check it. Don't take my word for it. Search the scriptures and see. He's the first one in the Bible to preach the cross as good news and to glory in it. People always bring up, Peter mentioned the cross in Acts 2. Of course he did. Of course he did. But how did he, how did he preach it? As a murder indictment. He wasn't saying good news, Christ died for you. He said bad news, you killed your Messiah. Now, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.8, had the princes of this world known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. God had very good reason for keeping it secret. And as in, yes, the facts were prophesied that he would die, that he'd be raised the third day, but uh, all that it would accomplish and the gospel that Paul preached concerning it, that was a mystery revealed to Paul. Paul said he got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12. So the cross work of Christ is the secret to God's dealings with sinners in every age. But it was not fully revealed until this present age. Now here, in a nutshell, by faith, the Old Testament saints followed the Word of God. They, they followed the commandments He gave them. And when they failed, by faith, they brought the required sacrifices as a covering to their sins. And by the way, there was revelation before the law. And there was a way to approach God given before... I mean, go back to Cain and Abel. There was a way to come to God. They had to bring the blood of the Lamb. Okay, that was revealed. Otherwise, how could Abel do it by faith if it wasn't revealed from God? So, what happened was, through the forbearance of God, He allowed the blood of bulls and goats to cover sins, but they could not take away sins. And so in Hebrews 10, verse 4, it says, It's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And so they had to continually offer them. But what was happening is he did this because he knew, obviously, the blood of Christ would be shed for the remission of sins. And that's why it says in Romans 3.25, Whom God hath set forth, talking about the Lord Jesus, and the redemption that is in Christ, as it says in verse 24, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, satisfied the wrath of God on sin, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. It's not talking about our past sins, because all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven the moment we believe. He's talking about the sins of the past and the past ages. God covered them, allowed them to be covered when they, with a repentant heart and a believing heart, followed His Word and brought the sacrifices. By faith they did it. By the way, what God knew their heart. If somebody just brought a sacrifice just to do it out of ritual and it wasn't something they really believed, it, it wouldn't have mattered to God. In fact, God got to the point He said He hated their sacrifices because it was not out of a repentant, believing heart. So, here's the bottom line of this first point. In the eternal state, when all things are gathered together in one in Christ, there's still going to be distinction. There's going to be Israel. There's going to be the body of Christ. There are going to be Gentile nations. But it's all going to be gathered together in Him, in one, in Christ. Everybody in eternity... All of the redeemed from any age, they're going to be there because of the blood of Christ. They're not going to be there because of their works. Period. Now, we've got to be very clear on that. I mean, can you imagine throughout eternity some guy saying, Oh, I'm so glad I got baptized. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. Well, maybe that's true in a sense, but the fact is, if it wasn't for the blood of Christ, your water baptism wouldn't have meant anything. You understand? It's the blood. Okay, so next thing is, the condition for salvation in every age, essentially, when you boil it on down, is what? It's faith. Okay? Now, without faith... 
It's impossible to please God. And one of the great chapters on this is Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him. And when, what you have in Hebrews 11 is you have a whole chapter that gives you examples of how faith was demonstrated before the law, under the law. Old Testament saints, they all obtained a good report from God. How? Faith. Now, Abel brought a sacrifice. Why did God accept it? Verse 4. And we're just giving you the first example. There's a whole bunch of examples, but the first one is that it shows you what, what the point is. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being, yet, being dead yet speaketh. And so it's by faith. It's through faith. All through Hebrews 11. Okay? So... God had revealed that they were to bring that sacrifice, and Abel, with a believing heart, followed the word of God. God and he uh, was accepted. Cain was rejected, even though, by the way, Cain, you know, he wasn't an atheist. He was worshiping God, his way, the way of Cain, the bloodless way, trusting in his works. Anybody that trusts in their works. I'm talking about, look, even in a dispensation where God tells man you need to do some things, if a man is self-righteous, he's not trusting the Lord. All right. It's always faith in the Lord. Now, number three, the object, what are we to believe? Very simple, the Word of God. Okay, now look, let's use just some common sense here. You, has God said the, the same? Well, I'm, I'm jumping the gun. That's my next point. <laughs> he hasn't said the same thing to man in every age. We're going to get there, but, but let's talk a minute about faith. Faith is not just believing something. Okay, people say they, they act like faith is just believing. You know, you can believe a lot of things. You can believe in the Easter Bunny. That's not faith. Faith is a Bible word. Faith is believing God. Look in Romans chapter 4. Let me give you a definition of faith. Typically, people go to Hebrews 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And that's a good description of faith, but one of the clearest definitions in the Bible is in Romans 4. The father of faith, Abraham. By the way, Paul said that not all men have faith. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 2. Everybody believes in something. I told somebody recently that was agnostic, I said, well, you, have, you believe, you accept things based on your mind and the mind of others, but there's nothing better to trust than the infallible Word of God that proves itself. If you're not going to believe the Word of God, you're going to believe something. And if you're going to tell me you think there was a big bang, that's what you think, but you don't know that. Right? You're, you're, at the end of the day, we're all going to believe something. Okay? Now, <laughs> there's nothing more solid to rest on than the Word of God, since God cannot lie. All right, Romans 4, verse 3. Uh, For what saith the Scripture? That's always the best question to ask. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What was? Believing God. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. All right, look at verse 3. Abraham believed God, it was counted for righteousness. Verse 5, his faith is counted for righteousness. What is faith? Believing God. Believing God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. All right, now, number four. And don't worry, we're going, we're making good time, but it's fixing to just fall apart, and I'm going to spend an hour on the last point, okay? <laughs> the content is not the same in every age because it's not the same 
Message. The content of faith. Faith is believing God. So what has God said? If you think God has said the same thing to man in every age so he can be saved, you've never read the Bible, evidently, because it does not take much reading to see different messages that God has given man to believe. God has not always told men, to him that worketh not, but believeth, He's, he's not always said that to man. He's, never, he's, he's not always said, hey, don't do anything but simply trust the finished work of Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, and you're saved instantly, permanently, complete in Christ, accepted in the Beloved, sealed with the Spirit, justified by the faith of Christ. That's not been said in every age. That's said in this age. Look in James 2. I know you know the passage, but it's so clear now what happens, people come to James 2 and they say, well, that's not even talking about salvation. That's talking about testimony. You've got to be justified before men. You know, I think it's in Luke 16 where Christ looked at the Pharisees and he said, you are they who justify yourselves before men. And he rebuked them for it. James is talking about justification. Okay, and we know what that is. And here's the thing. In time past, he, God required works of men to prove their faith. He's going to do that again in the future. In past ages and also after this age, you can see in the Bible where God tells man, okay, this is what you need to do. If you believe me, this is what you need to do about it. Look, if, if, Noah, if, if Noah said, you know what, I don't believe it's going to rain, I don't believe it's going to flood, and I'm not building the ark, would that have been faith? No. God, God's word to him was the floods come and build the ark. So faith acted on that. And by the way, when you go to Hebrews 11, guess what you see a lot of? Activity. Man proving his faith in what God said. So if God requires works, real faith will seek to do those works. But the, let me be clear. The works in and of themselves have never and will never save a sinner. That's not the issue. The issue is faith. So, when you come to James 2, notice what he said in verse number... Well, I'm not going to read the whole passage for sake of time. You know what it says, but let's skip down to verse number 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified, not by faith only. Not by faith only. So he's teaching it's faith that works. It's, let, me, let me encourage you. Don't tell people it's faith and works. That's not clear enough. That sounds like it's two different things. It's not two different things. It's faith that works. Okay. So if God's message to you says repent and be baptized, what does faith do? It gets baptized, right? If somebody, the Pharisees said, no, we're not going to be baptized of John. Jesus said, you've rejected the counsel of God against yourselves. Luke chapter 7. So, the faith is believing God. What has God said? If God says, you need to do these things, then that's what faith will do. Now, the whole issue in James 2 is he's talking about a man's faith. And he brings up Abraham, how he believed God, and yet 40 years later he was tried and he was justified by works. It was a process. And yet Paul deals with Abraham in Romans 4 and he singles out one thing. The, the difference is audience. Paul is applying it one way to one group, James another way to another group. James is looking at the whole picture. Paul focuses on one thing. Now that's a whole study in of itself. I can't possibly get into right now. But you have to understand, James and Paul are talking to different people under different dispensations. You can't get around it that in the tribulation, if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to the lake of fire no matter what you said you believed. That's, that's some, in other words, if you really believe the message in the 70th week of Daniel, you're going to overcome the beast by faith, rejecting his mark, enduring to the end. That's not what we have to do today. And so, I, you know, it's so essential. Now, look in, look, look in uh, Galatians 2. And, you know, this, and I've preached a whole message on this, and I'm sure I will again. I don't have time to do it justice tonight. But just look at James 2, or excuse me, Galatians 2. 
When you compare James 2 with Romans 3 and 4, they don't match. They don't need to match. And when you rightly divide the word of truth, you don't have to water down James 2 and pretend it's saying something else. You can accept what it says and understand what he's saying. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, <clears throat> Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we which have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Boy, how clear is that? Now look in chapter 3, Galatians 3, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Yes, we need to believe on Christ. We need to believe the gospel, the grace of God, that he died for our sins. That he was buried, that he rose again the third day, trusting in him. But look what he says. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. How can you say it's the same in every age when there was a time where the faith of Christ was not revealed? Okay, and by the way, the only time you read about the faith of Christ as in justification is Paul's epistles, and it's a number of times. And yet you only have that in the King James Bible. All the modern versions, including the New King James, change it. That's one of the fundamental doctrines in the age of grace. There's a difference between faith in Christ and faith of Christ. Of and in are not the same word. I'm not trying to be smart. I'm just being this common sense, right? I mean, it's a different thing. Now, we need to put our faith in Christ. But the faith of Christ, what, his, is Christ, is his faith perfect? Has it been proven? That's why when I believe on him and I'm justified by his faith, it's not a process. It's done. But a man has to prove his faith. A man's faith is not perfect. He has to prove it. God tries their faith like a refiner's fire, and they have to go through that tribulation. And there's a reason why he does that with Israel. I can't even scratch the surface on this tonight. But you know what? For a sinner in this present age to try and be justified by faith and works and say, well, I'm going to believe on Christ and endure to the end and get baptized and do this and then do that, you know what that proves? He doesn't really have faith. If you really have faith in the gospel, the grace of God, you're going to quit trying to be saved. You're just going to trust Christ and know you're saved. As long as you're trying to do something to be saved, you don't believe the message. But a man in the tribulation says, I'm going to take the mark of the beast because I'm saved. I believed and I got eternal security. That's not true for him. And, and, and if that's his attitude, if he thinks he can take the mark and still go to heaven, he's wrong. If he really believes... What's being preached to him in that period, he'll know he can't do that. You can't mix this stuff up. You see what I'm saying? Now, the word gospel, it, it basically means good news from God. Not just any good news, but God's good news. And as good as God is, do you really think he has only one message of good news all through the ages? We've talked about this in other studies, so I won't turn to all these passages. But for an example, there was a gospel preached to Abraham according to Galatians 3 verse 8. And Paul tells you what it is. In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Galatians 3 8. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel to Abraham. What was it? Here's the good news. In thee shall all nations be blessed. Well, Paul said the gospel he preached in the same epistle of Galatians in chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he said he got it by revelation. Can't be the same thing God preached to Abraham, the scripture preached to Abraham. It's, it was good news to Abraham, all right? Uh, you can go into Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 and find out about a gospel that was preached to Israel in the wilderness about entering in the land of promise. It was called a gospel. It can't be the gospel we're saved by today. Um, the gospel of the kingdom. They were preaching it without 
even believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. It's the good news of the promised, prophesied kingdom being at hand. And Jesus said, when that gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world, the end shall come. Paul said his gospel went in all the world in Colossians 1 verse 6. The end still hadn't come, even though it's been almost 2,000 years. can't be the same message unless you think Jesus was mistaken. <laughs> serious. you see how serious this is? Look, gospel of the kingdom was preached before this age. Gospel of the kingdom will be preached after this age. What about the everlasting gospel the angel preaches in the last half of the 70th week? It's about God's judgment. And yet we're living in the age of grace. So when you compare the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14, that's not going to be preached until the end of the 70th week. There's different gospels, and I'm not going to try to list them all, but there's a number of them. All you got to do is read what they say and compare the messages. And if they're different messages, they're different messages. You know what some people say, though? They say, it's all the same. It's just different ways of talking about the same thing. It can't all be the same. Now, I know that the gospel of Christ is the gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel of peace. And there's different ways, the glorious gospel. Uh, and there, but, but, but there are clearly different messages that God has revealed to men in different ages to believe. It's just that simple. Now, lastly, the results are not the same in every age as pertaining to position, blessings, destiny. Not the same. The results of faith are not the same in every age because God has not given believers in every age the same position, the same blessings, the same destiny. Now look, there is doctrine revealed in Paul's epistles concerning our position, our blessings, our destiny as the body of Christ that you won't, read, you won't find these things in the Old Testament. You won't find them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You won't find them in Hebrews to Revelation. They're not there. So we need to quit trying to force things that are different to be the same. What people do is they take Pauline doctrine and they try to force it into every other age. And they anticipate revelation. They take what they now learn from Paul, revealed to him, and read it back in the Old Testament as though they knew all that. They didn't. Now... This information is only found in Paul's epistles because he's the one to whom the glorified Christ from heaven revealed it. And Christ committed these truths to Paul to make it known. Now look, in what other age are believers said to be complete the moment they believe? Where is that? You don't find that outside of Paul? I don't think so. Where is it said they are sealed with the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Moses said in the book of Numbers, I wish all God's people had the Holy Spirit. Do you ever read that verse? Remember when me, dad, and be dad, and me, dad, and those dads, those boys, they were trying to prophesy, and they came and complained to Moses, say, hey, they're prophesying. He said, hey, don't complain to me about it. I'm paraphrasing. I wish all God's people had God's Spirit. <laughs> Paul said, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. All God's people do have His Spirit today. Holy Spirit would come on people and leave people, and that was different in the Old Testament. Let me ask you this question. How could God bestow the blessings that were purchased by the cross of Christ before He even made the purchase? Nobody went to heaven in the Old Testament. You show me the verse where they died and went to heaven. They were gathered under their people. They were. Jesus pulls back the curtain and gives us a glimpse of what happened in the Old Testament when people died. The lost went to torment. Those that believed God went to comfort, but they both went to the heart of the earth. Because the cross hadn't been accomplished yet. Now look, very briefly, and I'm finished our position, you know these things already, I'm just reviewing. But think about it. Our position as members of the body of Christ, we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. 
We are complete in Him, accepted in Him. It's instant. It's permanent. There's no process to it. We don't have to prove our faith. This, we are, Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And yet Jude warned the people, keep yourself in the love of God. We talked about that in another study. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We who are sealed with the Holy Spirit should never pray, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's what David prayed in Psalm 51. The Spirit of the Lord would never depart from us like he did King Saul. You ever read that verse? The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. You know what that means in the Hebrew? <laughs> it means he departed from him. <laughs> okay? Now, look, it's plain English. People just don't want to accept it. Um, we're never told to endure unto the end. But rather, Paul says, Christ will confirm us to the end. You see, look, when we believe the gospel of the grace of God, we're baptized by one spirit and one body. Not all believers in all ages are the body of Christ. Okay, and if you think that, you just made that up. John R. Rice said that the body of Christ started with Adam. He just made that up, and people believed it because he's a doctor. <laughs> Dr. John R. Rice, and he had a paper. He must be right. I'm sure he loved the Lord. I'm not doubting his salvation or his love for God. I, don't, I, don't, I never met the man. He died before I was probably, when did he die? I think he died in, when I was just a toddler. So I'm not, it's not about John R. Rice. What I'm saying is he, men like that say those things, but they can't back, there, you can't back that up with the Word of God. You can't say the body of Christ started with Adam. And what happens is people say, what, but do you know who said that? Why does it matter who said that if it's not in the Bible? People are so impressed with men, you know. Anyway, we're, no, only in this age is God forming the body of Christ. By the way, there couldn't have been a body of Christ before the cross. Okay, Now, I believe it started when Christ revealed the gospel, the grace of God to Paul. But that's another study for another time. But you have to admit at least, it couldn't have started before the cross because it's formed by the cross. Furthermore, it couldn't have started till after the ascension because Christ is the head of the body at the right hand of the Father. So if you had the body of Christ start before Christ ascends and glorify the right hand of the Father, you got a headless body. That don't work. So we're the body of Christ. What about the blessings? Well, our blessings are spiritual and in heavenly places, Ephesians 1.3. They're not material blessings on the earth like Deuteronomy 28. And we don't get our blessings by keeping the commandments of the law, but by being in the body of Christ. There's a difference in our blessings. Some of the blessings are the same, but there are differences you can look at on these matters. And what about our destiny? The body of Christ is destined to reign with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, verse 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 1, we're going to get a new body that's eternal in the heavens. But Israel's going to reign on the earth. How do I know that? The Bible says that about a hundred times or more. I'm not saying, by the way, we'll never come to the earth. I'm not making that statement, but I'm talking about the primary inheritance that there's a new Jerusalem. It's going to come down to the earth, by the way. And there's a certain inheritance concerning the new Jerusalem and the earth that is always spoken of in regard to Israel. Ours is above that, and there's a difference. And I, there's so many verses to prove all that. So, look... There's a lot of details to get into. But if you understand these basic five things, that there could be no salvation without the blood of Christ. God has always wanted man to believe him. That's always been the way to come to God is through faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith is believing what God said, but God has not said the same thing in every age. And when people believe what God said, it has not brought the same results in every age. This is provable, folks. This is not theory. See, most people have no problem with these three. <laughs> when you get down to these last two, that's where you're going to find out that some people love tradition more than truth. But again, 
if you don't rightly divide these things, it will lead to confusion and major problems. It's when people mix the different messages in different ages together. Look, there's things in the Bible that apply in every age. We understand that. Okay, we understand that. But there are things that if you start mixing them, man, it leads to major, major problems. So one thing I request, and, and, and I'm not saying this for any reason in particular. I just, for myself, I need to make sure I need to do a better job being clear. When you talk to people about salvation in other ages, make sure you, they understand you believe it's always faith. It's not ever the works by themselves. That's, that's how we come across sometimes, and we better be careful not to do that because that's not true. All right. More we can say, but we'll stop. Father, thank you.